We've got some fresh new young talent doing some things that I know you haven't heard before. One, two, three, listen. Welcome to Finances, your home for all things financial, investment, money, and lifestyle. Hosted and curated by the very talented team of certified financial planners, Burke Britain Financial Partners. This is the Finances Podcast. Ben Kemp, Jay Burke, and our guest today is uh, Director at Geelong Real Estate Co., Ricky Fort. If I pronounce that right, Ricky? Perfect. Yeah. I, 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 actually, it's a great start. I actually spelt it wrong on our notes, and Ben was yeah, concerned that I was going to give you the, the oh, notes. Yeah. But, uh, Ricky, I'm not going to read your bio. Maybe if you can give us a, a little backstory of mm. Geelong Real Estate Co., I know you've only been in operation in that format for. Is it two or three years? Yeah, two years, yep. Yeah. So give us a little bit of your backstory and also how you found yourself to be a director in your own real estate agency in 2023. Mm, well- We've actually been neighbours for a while now. Obviously, you didn't know that, but oh, I, I, I forgot to say thanks for walking all the way up the steps to <laughs> yeah, be with us this morning. Yeah, it's about 100 metres. afternoon. 100 metres. So, originally, a flashback in Japan, I started with Buxton Real Estate. We were obviously downstairs and the shop over from where I am now. So, yeah, I've been in real estate nine years and um, worked for Buxton and then for McGrath and I... Yeah, got Jack doing that. I thought it's time to do my own thing. And yeah, real estate's one of these sectors, probably not different from your own. It's it's a people-based business and, and you get out what you put in. And I've always been a hard worker and ambition's not a dirty word I've found in my family. And so, yeah, so why not? Let's give it a go. Now, you weren't originally from Geelong. Did I read that right? That you were actually- boy. Yep. Yep, Ballarat. I can read and write. So, <laughs> but yeah, I grew up in Ballarat, moved to Geelong in uh, 2003. My parents bought a pub in 2003. Great way to meet girls, obviously, giving out free, free beers at the bar and- <laughs> So, yeah, it was a great segue, obviously, into real estate. It's, yeah, it's, as I said before, it's a people-based business and it's not what you know, it's who you know. So, yeah, moved to Geelong in 2003, uh, had the pub for five or six years and then my parents come up to retirement age and, and I thought, shit, I better get a real job. So, over that time, I'd been doing the banking with Bendigo Bank just up the road here in Aberdeen Street and made friends with those guys and they come in on a Christmas party and I... <laughs> hit them up <laughs> yeah li- li- liquid them up and then my mum hit them up for a job and yeah, next thing I knew I was working at Bendigo Bank did five or six years there and what was, what was your role at Bendigo so I um, started out just on the counter just doing the standard sort of thing and then I actually transitioned into I don't know how I, I just fluked it but I landed a job as Victorian Tasmania uh, social media manager for the community bank thing so again no qualifications whatsoever just yeah how long goes this? Well, it's back in before the, social media. It was back when <laughs> that was funny. The person that hired me, she was like a fifty-year-old woman, and she said I, th- I was running like a Movember campaign in the yeah. local branch, and I was getting customers to donate money, and I was cutting out little mustaches and sticking them on this thing and taking photos with people. And we put it on social media, and it went aka viral. And yeah, this fifty-five-year-old woman who had been tasked with building, you know, Benio Bank's social media platform said, you're great at social media, you can have the job. So, I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, is, that when, is that when social media was literally just Facebook? We had, there was Twitter as well at that okay. point and Instagram had just started coming in. So, yeah, got into that. As I said, absolutely no skills or qualifications. Well, back then there wasn't a qualification for it. So, yeah, did that and loved it. And then, yeah, a friend of mine, yeah, been working at the bank for yeah five or six years and I'd gone up, I guess you could say like, yeah, however many runs and, my pay had only kind of increased like 10 or 20% in six years. And I had a friend that sold a house for me for Buxton and he said to me, geez, you'd be, you'd be great at this. And we, I eyed off his pay slip and I thought, shit, I'm in the wrong industry. So yeah, obviously the rest is history. So jumped he in. voluntarily showed you his pay slip. That sounds a bit like uh, the he, Wolf he, of Wall Street. He, yeah, it? 100%. <laughs> show me a, what do you say? Show me a, a slip with yeah, $40,000. Quit my job and work for you right now. It's That's right. pretty much what happened. So it was Dylan Taggart from Buxton. And yeah, yeah as I said, we were downstairs and. I worked for him for a couple of years and then went off and did my own thing and then, yeah, got sidetracked and went to McGrath and I was there for a couple of years and then, yeah, during COVID, just thought, you know, it's a great time to open a business. So, jump ship and do what I'm doing now. That's a fair. Well, for those people that haven't actually started their own business, how did you find that uh, foray? Not only into into real estate, obviously, you're already in real estate, but actually establishing your own business from scratch. Where did you start? Yeah, there's more to it than it looks, obviously. I probably didn't know what I was getting into. I probably wouldn't have done it, but... It probably, and this might resonate with some of the listeners, it was more of a financial decision. I, I realized that, especially during COVID, and it's not so much about where I used to work, but there was a bit of a thing at the time. People were losing their jobs left, right, and center. It's like, hang on, it doesn't matter how hard you work for people, it's the job security and their loyalty isn't a guarantee. And I thought, in sales, it's probably similar to um, finance and stuff as well. It's all about trails and commissions and things like that. And so once you've 
you get paid in real estate for what you did three months ago. And three months later, if you break your leg or you stop working, your income dries up. And I thought, you know what, this isn't for me. I need something that's got some stability. And I just tried to future proof as well, grow an asset in terms of the rent roll and the sales business and, and something to sell when I'm old and decrepit, which isn't far away. Did you buy an existing book or did you start from zero? No, no. So, yeah, just took out the lease downstairs and fronted a shop front and got your business cards and away. Literally. literally, literally. What's, website. what's first the name and then, and then somewhere to trade from and then you work the rest out Pretty later. much. That's true. Pretty, pretty much. Later. Like someone said to me, yeah, before I got started, I was procrastinating. It was taking a while and they just said, look, if you wait till you get this right, you're never going to do it. So, I just manned up and just did it and just figured the rest out on the fly and yeah, so the sign went up and it just exploded. I just got really lucky. And, but also with COVID too, right? Like real estate agents were just making money hand over fist and I just was literally in the right place at the right time. I, I can't say that it was anything other than that. And for the first maybe like six to 12 months, I was giving all my rental leads away to another agency, um, just a friend that I had in the industry. There's no like cash back or anything, just a relationship thing. And and then it kind of dawned on me. I'm like, right, I'm actually up. I'm paying the bills. It's probably time to, you know, take that next step and put on a property manager. And again, it's all just salaries and things like that, right? You know, that's 100, another 120K you got to come up with. And yeah, once I got to that point, I'm like, you know what, let's do it. And just every every time, so I'm probably sending the wrong message that because <laughs> everything for me has just been luck. I've just, it's, it's just about having a go. That's probably the biggest thing. You started it and you'll work it out. If you're passionate enough about it, you just make it yeah, work. I just probably would die trying i guess i'd just yeah. give something a go and yeah i think it's a lesson for the listeners and anyone that ever wants to reach out whether it be any sort of business even real estate like I, there's no competitions on a bad thing anyone that's interested or wants advice like um i'm just like yourself right you guys are just here to help people that's what the podcast is about yeah so yeah, yeah reach out Although we can't, this is not formal advice, is it, Ben? No. <laughs> General in nature. Yeah, hundred percent. So we just claim event. That segue of starting the business and moving into, or right when COVID was starting, mm. that probably is a nice segue into sort of the Geelong property <sighs> market. And first of all, what you saw as COVID was hitting, what mm. was happening from your perspective with boots on the ground in real estate, and then. What have you seen over the course of what is now? How long ago was COVID? It's still here, well, isn't it? Yeah. Named it's still COVID nineteen, but yeah, yeah, yeah. It's still going. But it just went bananas. Like there was that very short period, as I said before the podcast started. I um I took the lease and I was paying rent, and it was about four or six weeks. And first of all, the shop flooded, which is great. And then just after that, we start you know got locked down, had to work from home. But to answer your question about the real estate market, people were essentially putting in offers sight unseen, like first inspection five or ten percent above the range like it was just bananas like it was so who was doing that were they melbourneites were they uh there was definitely yeah definitely melbourneites but i think externally people were thinking that geelong it was only melbourneites but geelong's always had the strongest appetite for geelong property in my opinion but the sight unseen uh, even geelong, offers were with yep, geelong people yep, making offers sight yep, unseen okay. yeah yeah and that was amazing. Obviously, like a really fruitful time for everyone. Not um, much. Yeah, yeah I know. No, right? We're about to get onto the doom and gloom of what is now. But yeah, there was a time there when it was just obviously unsustainable. Hence, you know, we're paying for it now. But it was good times. Yeah. And what about the? Were you doing online auctions? How were you operating through that period of time? What were you doing? Yeah, it was a lot of online auctions. It was a lot of virtual tours. Lots of I've always done a lot of video, lots of high quality photos, things like that. So you just try to make the buying process as easy as we could for people. Yeah. Mm. So let's fast forward what is now maybe three years. What has been the transition from that sort of unsustainable <coughs> growth or expansion in property prices during COVID mm. to where we are now? Where have you actually seen the trend and where is it? Where do you see it currently now? It's not great. It? It's not great. Okay. So what, what's, what's not great? Well, it's just, I, I think the run's over really. Like there's, and we'll talk about that in a sec. There's, there's hot parts and, and there's not so hot parts, but I think. It depends where you get your data from too, like, the, and we'll talk about that too, but data's all over the shop. But I've kind of felt that over the last 12 months, like it's been a slow, gradual decline, which has kind of been good because people can't really like notice. Notice as, the panic stuff. Yeah, yeah, notice as much. So, with every interest rate rise, you know, I think last year, the, some of the data I picked up before we jumped on the podcast from realestate.com said the property market in Geelong would come back about 12% across Geelong, which is, what's that, we have a mean percent per month. So, it's not really super noticeable. And I've always found that the only problem, people that had a real problem with the, the market and how much it had pulled back were people that had bought in that boom. Yeah. And unfortunately, like a lot of those ones are the ones that need to sell. Like they've just potentially overcommitted or 
or whatever, but anyone that's you know bought a property in the last five or six years, everyone's, as I said, made money hand over fist and it hasn't been a problem. Everyone's really enjoyed real estate and those transactions are still fine because people have got their head around, you know, I paid 600000 for it. It's now worth, you know, at the height of COVID, it was, it was maybe worth 880 Now it's worth 820 I'm still moving on. I'm not making that inverted commas loss. Like yep. I'm still making a, a capital profit. And they're still well ahead of what they paid, which 100%. is where those people that bought early stages are okay, the ones that got right at the top of the market. And stretched to do so. Mm. Danger times. And he probably talks about this a lot in recent weeks or you know, just with each other and other guests and stuff. Unfortunately, there's people out there that are going to get stung mm. and there'll be a handful that have to sell forcibly, which is not ideal. Yeah. There's always property changing hands though, isn't there? Like even in these times, again, that you might not be flying above the top of a, a reserve or what the range is, but there's always property still changing hands, just a little bit slower, a little yeah, bit what, different. What is it? The three Ds, death, divorce and debt. So, yeah. yeah, there's still plenty of reasons and opportunities for people to buy, relocating for work. You know, I'm a big advocate still for Geelong. You've got NDIS, WorkSafe, TAC, all those white collar jobs that are still coming to Geelong. So, I don't think, yeah, it's not all doom and gloom, but it, it's different sectors of the market that are doing well. So, I... Quickly, if, if you got time. I, yeah, I we've got all the time yeah. in the world, mate. Go for <laughs> I it. I just thought we'd quickly go through potentially some opportunities as well that I see in the market. So, in terms of, you know, I'm not here spruiking the market and telling people to make shit financial decisions, but I think sometimes the market's, you know, be guided by you and keen to hear your thoughts at your podcast. But I think there's opportunities in areas where properties are potentially overcorrected. So, major renovations. So, it's probably one of the main areas I think that's overcorrected. Anything that a buyer looks at like in the heart of Geelong West, a period, you know, Cal Bungalow, something like that, anything that needs re-stumping, people just now is like, nah, too hard. <laughs> and, they just, and then they just pack it up. So, And same thing with like, you know, wood rot or external weatherboard things and stuff like that. People were just so petrified. Like I've got a prime example. I sold two on Autumn Street just up the road from our offices directly opposite the McDonald's car park. So one of the footy boys bought one. It was renovated period it was beautiful it was all done not a crazy renovation but that sold for 880 and the house next door nine months later unrenovated same floor plan same everything but needed re-stumping needed a few new weatherboards sold for 660 so it's do not the 220 math, work, 220 <laughs> there's not 220 grand worth of work but people just shit themselves and oh that's too hard like so that to me i think if you if you know what you're looking for and you're getting the right advice there's bargains out there so there's probably that sector the the land sector is in my opinion the hardest hit sector of the market so it's probably land still transacting but it's really the people that bought a block of land you know two years ago they paid x for it there's been a lot of capital growth they've decided now because obviously the interest rate was two percent it's now six percent the build was going to be 400 and it's now 620 and so all those factors it's funny when they call me there's all this tough talk oh you know we've just had a change of mind we're not going to build anymore we're gonna that's like hang on you can't afford it yeah. just call it out you better just be honest and yeah, you, you know on. where you stand. Because as well, as well yeah, the advice, I, I speed the advice up. I'm like, all right, let's get to that and let's just get it happening. Where some people think that, that it's they a pride to, thing, isn't it? I they think don't so. want to swallow it. I think so. Yeah. So the only land that we're kind of seeing sell is, yeah, those people that bought that block of land for 360, they've had it for two years. They can still sell it for 400 or 410 so that they can cover stamps and they can make a small profit. But it's hard because they look at the one that the developer's now selling for, like inverted commas, selling. It's online for 520. It's yeah. not moving. But those people can still sell and can still make a profit. If it wasn't, for those people, the land sector just be non-existent, wouldn't be happening. But the third sector, and I'm sure you've got plenty of customers in this sector, is the development stock. So it's those ones that, you know, 1,000 square meters, Hamlin Heights, maybe Jewel Street frontage or something like that. They've been the hottest sector of real estate since I've been in real estate, my nine years. Like every mum and dad investor is like, you know what, I'm going to go to, you know, buy something, knock it over, go to Simmons, three townies. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Battle axe it. It's Battle axe it. It's everyone's yeah. like, people have loved doing that. Now, people can't give those away. Mm. And that to me is just stupid. I think do your due diligence. Come and see guys like you. Get some advice. Make some moves because I'm seeing some really good properties just Go by the way, so I think people are a little bit fearful, aren't they? To again, a lot of them have been squeezed from their borrowing capacity, which we were talking about the other day, where they probably could have serviced to knock, you know, do a battle axe build and sell it off and make a dollar. And now they actually, some of them just can't because they yep. actually physically they can't get lending, or they're just a little bit hesitant around cost to build and things like that. Or, or they're a little bit pessimistic. Or they're pessimistic. And for every one of those, there's you know, we find there's an optimistic person as well who is looking and ready. And if you set yourself up well enough, this is when you should be getting excited, not fearful. Mm. That's probably the thing for our clients is we're just trying to go, right, you know, hold, 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 be ready to go when mm. that opportunity arises. So 
when people suffer, I thought someone else benefits. So <laughs> there's going to be a bit of that. Never a true word. It's money makes money, I guess. And, and you got to have it and you got to be brave. But seeing these opportunities that it just, it happens all the time. Like we've got one in South Valley Road at the moment, 87 South Valley Road. It'll probably be sold by the time this goes to air. But same thing, big subdivider. You have, like, we had 20 people go through the open for inspection, and you've got a very few percentage of those actually know value. A lot of them have looked at it and said, Oh, that's a shit heap. Well, this needs too much work. And, and they've, I said, I wouldn't pay X for this. And they're offering, like, not offering, but that their opinion of value is 10 or 20% under what it's going to transact for. And it's like, you've actually got no idea. You've got to be polite and be like, Yeah, of course, we'll keep an eye out for the next one. But realistically, then you find the person who buys it and they know that that's good value. And I'm going to turn a 30% profit on this in the next 18 months. You also got those people who think that the numbers are worse than what they are so they think that everyone's desperate to sell oh. and that they can lowball them yeah. and again we talked about this other day but when the market started to go up rapidly at the start of COVID people go no no wait we'll wait we'll wait and they didn't read the market and didn't read value so they didn't move quick enough and then they just didn't buy anything mm. or they end up buying way later mm. costing themselves heaps yep. and now you've got when it's on the down is that people who are a little bit pessimistic will think it's got 20% more, more to, to go, go down yep. so they wait 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 and then before they know it you've bounced Again, mm. yeah, you know. missed the bottom. Yeah, <laughs> I think the same thing happened with COVID the first time it came around. I guess people were looking for that the bottom, and you know, oh, how's it going to? They're going to drop another thirty percent, and went the other way. Yeah. So, and some agent, I had know someone, and an agent said, "You need to sell this house now, or it's going to be worth twenty percent less in mm. six months' time." And they just obviously told them that because they wanted to list it and sell it. I don't. And they end up listing it, selling it bang immediately and you know they probably mm. did themselves out of one hundred fifty grand if they just held the line. They didn't need to sell it, yeah, but they just got. Spooked, why? Spooked. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's just where, and you know, I've got that as one of the things I want to chat about. Just make sure you're getting the right advice from the right people. So maybe let's talk about that. Getting, as I know you were in your uh, pre show notes, you mentioned. I was very impressed. It was pre show notes. <laughs> <laughs> <That's right. laughs> you were talking about your uh, disappointment with where people actually source their information from. So let's talk about that. Where are most people finding their the information, their data around mm. property? Where are mm. they getting their assumptions and their information from? And second to that, where should they be going to get some advice or to be making an informed decision about what they do? Question one, where do they get the advice? God knows. Like, yeah. TikTok. TikTok. All the wrong places, I think. Because, again, going back to, you know, my, my friend thinks it's a bad time. I shouldn't buy. And, and they're turning a blind eye to an amazing opportunity or vice versa. They're potentially selling sooner than they don't have to and things like that. So, but I just probably want to take the opportunity to encourage people to get advice from – so, again, won't name names. Used to work at Bendigo Bank and there was people in and around there that were financial planners that were not financial. They were renting. And this isn't – rent vesting is a thing, like yeah. it's snobbery stuff. But don't take advice from people that aren't doing or have done what you, you can do. Yeah, or are not where you want to be. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. Oh, yeah. I don't know why that's a hard strategy for people to get their head around. Like, why would you source information from someone who's not doing the things that you're aspiring to do? Well, I think one of the issues is that it's very easy to give advice. It's very hard to take your own advice. You see a lot of people that are that are able to dish out advice to other people, but they may be not taking on that advice themselves. So, yeah, finding someone that's actually doing what you want to do and has done it well and has got a track record and of success, it's pretty important. Mm. And, you know, like how the algorithms and stuff work, like information will find its way to you. You know, I, I want to shop for a yellow car and you've got yeah. yellow car syndrome, it's all over you, Google ads, things like that. And I think that what's happened with a lot of the negative sentiment in the news as well, like that just finds – if you, you stumble across one or two articles and you read it, you're doomed. Yeah. Like that just bombards your news feed and again, it just – take a breath and go and find better – sort. like I'm sure you'll be embarrassed even hearing this, but my favorite book's Robert Kiyosaki, like Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and I watch him on the – like he's got his own little podcast and things like that and I think if you're not taking advice from someone that's done it, yeah. just zip it. Yeah. Yeah. So. And it's amazing how what advice people will take because it just it feeds into what they were maybe thinking. Even there was that it was completely wrong, but oh, well, someone else said it. And that must be a good idea instead of actually checking the facts on that or getting an alternative opinion on it as well. We you tend get, to gravitate towards the narratives that confirm 
your confirmation uh, bias. Yeah, your original thought. And it then feels good. It doesn't feel great to actually see something that is contrary to your opinion or your belief. And not many people have got the brain capacity to stop and rethink and, okay, maybe. Admit they were maybe wrong or yep. maybe I should have done this. Or, as a, you know, it's the generational stance yeah. of how to do things. And, yeah, or be able to hold two yeah. alternative ideas or opinions in the head at the same time and objectively yep. look at both of them. And people take easy options. I was thinking about this when you were talking about the non renovated houses. Like people, like, they're just late, like in terms of that, they want to have to go through the hassle of renovating. Oh, we'll, we'll just pay an extra 50, 100 grand. It's already mm. done. And they'll justify it to themselves in that sense. You go, well, let's just walk in. We're done. We don't have to worry about it. Not anymore. Like and now it's different well, and you start to realize. That probably goes to the point of like being a generation of convenience. Like, it, it's extended itself to properties and the fact that we, we literally want convenience without any effort. We don't want to have to do any hard work, research, or maybe think I've got to put some time into this. Maybe that's reflective of us as a generation, maybe. I don't know. But I always think anything that appears to be was promoted on the guise of convenience is probably a trap. I heard that on the last podcast. I, that really resonated with me. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. So, is there anything else in terms of where people are getting their information from, where they shouldn't be getting it from, where they should be getting it from? And I suppose over to you, what advice are you giving to people about getting them prepared to make good decisions? It's a case by case. You've got to get belly to belly across the living room, you know, across the dining room table and, and find out people's situation and tailor the advice to that, I guess. So, you know, one of the guys that's just started working for me has moved down from Queensland, young family, wants to, is really anxious to get into the market. And it just depends what you're looking for and whether it's the right opportunity for you or not. So I'm in sales, right? We, we don't sell, we don't get paid, but I'm not jamming information that's not right for that person i'm like look if, if you're planning to sell this thing in the next 12 or 8 months it's probably not the right time you know unless you've got the skills and abilities that you're not paying retail to renovate a property and blah 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 like just do what's right for you yeah it depends on every person that's the key isn't it and we were talking about this the other day as well like there's never a bad time to be looking if you know you're good for it and you know you've got a long term on it like if, you know if it's mm. something that fits you've got everything in place you're rock solid you why not be looking? Why yep. not be buying? There's never a time that you just have to go, no, 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 never ever. Like yep. every single property is a different opportunity. Mm. There's some that were still, you know, the occasional one that slipped through the cracks even when the market's going up. Like there's always an opportunity mm. if you're looking at every opportunity. I think the point in that is preparedness. And yeah. like if anyone can, even in, in our world, any sort of anything, any decision that is of a financial nature, as soon as you have the emotions creep in and, and outweigh sort of the objective decision making you're kind of in trouble you're at the mercy of of how you feel about the situation rather than looking at the sort of objective facts so we've always been massive on people being really prepared when they're making any big financial decisions whether it be in property whether it be in the share market actually know what you're capable of why you're doing it generally puts people in a better position so when they come to you and you ask them what they're trying to achieve if they can clearly articulate that, you probably know that you're a better chance to mm. get them across the line or get them what they want. Going back to that thing you said before, Ben, about pride, I've got a good hypothetical for you boys. Okay, so, let's yeah. do it. So let's say you've got an investment property, right, and it's worth 500000 for argument's sake. And if this year is anything like last year and the property was to drop, say, 10% per annum in capital, so it's gone from five hundred to 450000 or – Let's look at it as a with a more of a glass half full perspective and just say it's a neutral year. It doesn't have capital decline. It doesn't have capital growth. One thought would be about hanging on to an investment. If you've got debt on your primary place of residence, what do you do? Do you sell it, pay down your capital debt, or do you hang on to it? It's a bit of a crystal ball and a bit of a stitch up. No notice whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. You know. But what are you doing? So the the scenario you've got, so this person's got an invest. Were you comparing the investment property versus the principal residence with the same? So give it to me again. Yeah. So you've got uh, investment property in Herne Hill. It's worth $500,000. Mm-hmm. And let's assume this year is sim- like calendar year is the same as last year and we see a 10% decline in the property's value. So it's now worth four fifty next year. It's crystal ball stuff. But you've got, you know, some debt on your primary place of residence. So you've got a $500,000 mortgage. And for argument's sake, you know, I saw some data that on for just over one year with the interest rate rises that we've seen, if you owed five hundred thousand dollars on your property, your interest repayments have gone up. Just the interest component's gone up twelve thousand dollars per annum. So, as I'm saying, if you've got debt on your primary place of residence and you've got an investment property that you know is not even going to have capital growth, it's going to have capital decline. What are you doing? Well, 
if we're making, generally speaking, if we're making rash decisions based upon the market conditions at the time, we've probably made the wrong decision in the first place about the asset that we've bought. I mean, the question would be, why did we buy that investment property in the first place? Why did I buy it? Did I buy it because I wanted to get long-term capital growth? Do I need income from that? Did I factor in the fact that interest rates are likely to go up anyway? Like, am I rushing? Am I panicking to actually sell that place because I need to clear my mortgage? I suppose, and also, what else have you got? Like, what other options? So, I think the biggest thing for any of our clients when we get them to the point where, you know, most people, they start out, they buy a home to live in. A lot of people have an ambition to have an investment property, but you want to have some other pool of wealth where, and it doesn't have to be the same size as an investment property but something else they can lean on which means they can endure a period where their cash flow has been stretched a bit or they've got enough surplus that we we factored it in like we run the projections with a two percent four percent five percent buffer on top so that we never have to be that person you know ideally again she goes wrong in life so sometimes there's there's outliers to that but if everything's ticking over that you can go mm, don't really want to sell it market's not the best yeah maybe it's going to probably we guess it's going to probably go down but we're not stressed. Let's continue to move forward with our broader strategy and hold that piece. Again, it's different if someone's on the verge of retirement. Again, if I went back a little bit, let's say they had it for 15 years and you know, they're about to turn 60, they're about to retire. We probably would have encouraged them to sell it 18 months ago when the market was flying and they could have got a good value for that property versus what they paid for it, knowing where they're at in that pivot point or reposition that into an, a more income-based property if yep. they were seeking income. So, yeah, it's a very long-winded response, well, but it, I think the answer to it is it depends. Like most things, it, it depends. It depends. That's pretty on. much the answer I was looking for. Is it? <laughs> and that's it. And this is why, again, find out who you're getting your advice from. Get it from better people because this is it. Too many armchair experts, mum and dad who, you know, oh, I was paying 19% and, you know, <laughs> like that shit's irrelevant now. Like just yeah. focus on better information before you make decisions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. if you went and bought it, and again, we see this with a lot of our clients have properties, multiple properties. And it's just the timing and the purpose. Like, there's so many different sorts of properties as well. Like you can't just say property. Like it's you know it's different yep. area. We've got you know units, townhouses might be more income based, and we've got the developers. Like so that might be the younger trying to get you know make some capital growth. It really depends on all the different properties, different mm. suburbs, different areas, different timing. It's not simple. I think people just bundle it all together. They look at the data that comes out of Sydney and apply it to Geelong. Like, mm. It's irrational. I think it goes back to, well, just yeah, good financial planning, making decisions before you get into it. But if you couldn't afford to weather the storm of a you know, 2% interest rate increase, you probably shouldn't be. It probably <laughs> isn't the time to be on, you know. Yeah. yeah. And assets. again, radical decisions made in a hurry are generally bad ones. And it generally means that you've made a, a poor choice in the first instance. But again, it depends. If people are out there in those circumstances, again, we said this in the last podcast. Go and get some support. Go and talk to people who know real estate. Go and talk to people who know how to ensure that you're cash flow ready and that you've got your assets in the right place and you've got your income at the right level to be able to borrow what you need. There's a few things. And for most people, it's a bit – sometimes that seems like too much hard work, right? Having to put in some effort. Ben's shaking his head. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, putting in some effort to prepare yourself to make good decisions with property or with the share market or just your own personal financial circumstances – yeah, it requires personal responsibility and most people want to, I shouldn't say most people, a lot of people want to deflect it to being someone else's problem. Mm. It's the Reserve Bank government's mm. fault because he didn't tell us that interest rates were going to rise so quickly or mm. he, he lied to us or you know, the property data is different. My real estate agent told me I'd get X mm. when it's not worth that. Take it upon yourself. Accountability. Yep. Couldn't agree more. What else do you have to tell us, Ricky, about the local property market? Obviously, this podcast goes out to everyone, but mostly our clients live in sort of the Geelong area. What else do we need to know about opportunities or threats in the Geelong region? Oh, going back to opportunities, I think it's, you know, be prepared. But to motivate people in terms of looking for investments is the rental market. So, I just did a quick bit of uh, Googleizing before I came on, obviously, as, as all good agents would do. But essentially, 9% capital growth in residential investments, uh, so rent in the last 12 months. Some fun data. So, 798 people on realestate.com have saved looking for just general rental properties in just the Geelong CBD, like, you know, fringes of East Geelong, South Geelong, blah, blah, blah. So, 798 people and there's only 71 properties available. So, 90% more demand than there is supply. So, 
What's your breakup at the moment, if you don't mind sharing, if you know it? Owner, occupier versus investor. What are you seeing? What's the breakup for you personally with your clientele? As in who's? Yeah, who's buying? Who's, who's selling? Buying. The tide's just starting to change. So the brave people are coming out and realizing there's been overcorrection. I'm ready to, to buy an investment or I've got good financial advice and I'm in a position, I've got a strong deposit, I can service this loan and I like the capital growth that this thing's got. So we're starting to see that. But I would say at this point, it's probably like 70, 30 owner occupy versus investor. Okay. And usually, I'm just a bread and butter real estate guy. So my average sale price is probably, you know, 750, 800,000. So it's not, you know, it's not the upper end. It's not. The lower end, it's just kind of in the sweet spot. But I would say traditionally, it's probably been not 50-50, but maybe 60-40 owner-occupier versus investor. And that obviously investors just evaporated completely and entirely um, for a long period of time. And they're just starting to make their way back. And, and those people that are coming back now are the educated ones. It's, yeah, no more real estate for sport like there's been, which is good. So is there anything else, Ben, anything else that you wanted uh, Ricky to cover off and before we let Ricky give us a, a plug on where to find Geelong Real Estate Co., how they can get in touch with you mm-hmm. and any closing comments from you. Ben, did you want to say anything no, else? No, I think that's that's good. I think the fact that you, again, promoting getting advice is probably the biggest thing. Look, I think. You like people, that? You know, I like that because, again, it's not every agent is the same and mm-hmm. a lot of them will clearly look after themselves first because, like you said, it is a sales business, mm-hmm. but if you respect I guess when the you industry own- as a whole and you know a bit more about 100%. people and what longevity looks like you've got to be real hit the nail on the head and i think that was a transition from being a salesperson into a you know owner of a business like i've got a family and a reputation to uphold and and trying to grow something so yeah we've got a long-term view like i'm in my late 30s now but i'd like to be thinking i'm going to be doing this for the next 20 years or so so yeah given the right advice it might not be fruitful in the short term but like you guys, we're here for the long term. And yeah. Listen, Geelong's a brilliant place if you're doing the right thing by people and you build relationships. If you do the wrong thing by people, it's, time, don't forget. it's, it's time to move out. Mm. So, Which is uh, how it should be. Yeah, 100%. It's, it's how it should be. Uh, relationships definitely do count. So, Ricky, if people are out there listening to this and they're either they're an investor looking to enter the Geelong property market, they're an owner-occupier uh, looking to make some decisions about, to, about selling their own place or, or looking to buy something, how can they get a hold of you? Where should they look? Well, the first thing they need to do is come to our seminar that we're running on the 19th of next month at the Novotel. It's uh, seats are capped at 60 people. So, it's yeah, you, half your audience wouldn't even get a look in. But, yeah, that's the first thing. If that's you, the 19th of April. Yeah, 19th of April. So, if, um, yeah, we're going to have, you know, people from Metricon and just a bit of an insight what's going on with the market, trends and, yeah, just probably a bit more of a deep dive. We can't cover it all in this podcast. So, that that would be the first thing. And then, obviously, if you wanted to reach out for any other general advice. So, my graphic designer thought the website ending in .co was a good idea. I can tell you now it's been a nightmare. People just <laughs> add, on, it. add on the M thinking they're doing you a favor, but um, oh, your website's broken. Piss off. So, yeah, geelongrealestate.co or obviously, yeah, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, all that fun stuff. So, yeah, reach out if you need a hand. Beautiful. Now, Thank you. Greco. That's me. How many people in the office roll around calling it Greco? Uh, no, that's a hard no for me. Okay. <laughs> no, it just came about. I was actually, I was so close. I'd registered the business name and, and built a website and a brand and everything just off my last name. And then I actually had a dream that it wasn't a good idea and that I couldn't sell it in the future. And yeah, it's a true story. And then last minute, I'm like, you know what? What's something that people would just search online to find a real estate agent? And then funnily enough, I jumped on ASIC and... <laughs> Geelong Real Estate Co. was still available. So, here we are. It's worked out all right. So, boom. Yep. Well, Ricky, thanks for joining us, mate. Thanks for walking up the steps to have a chat with <laughs> us. Let's make sure we do a, a round two and a round three in the future. Uh, it's great to hear thoughts on the market. And again, appreciate your time. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks, mate. Cheers. Cheers. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you're keen to understand more about how financial advice could benefit you, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Burke Britain FP or Google Burke Britain Financial Partners, check out our client reviews, testimonials, and make it time to meet one of our certified financial planners by clicking book now on our website. Thanks for listening. Any information contained in this podcast is of a general nature only. No account was taken as to the objectives, financial situation, or needs of any particular person. Therefore, before making any decision, listeners should consider the appropriateness of any information with regard to their particular objective, financial situation, needs, and seek independent advice from a licensed professional specific to their circumstances. All right, hit it. That translates to don't be a moron and act on what some random person says on a podcast. Take personal responsibility. Do your homework. Ask questions and speak to an actual human that knows what they're talking about before you do anything. Thank you.
and PP Financial Solutions Proprietary Limited Trading Burke Britain Financial Partners are authorized representatives of AMP Financial Planning Limited AFS license number 232706.